Hey guys. Hey there. Hi everyone. Another Friday, another case of <laughs> the Friday fraudsters. All right, so let me start off by saying one person got it. Alaba, Tupac changes. The intro song for this week, I dedicated it to a young man who would have been 50 years old this past Wednesday, Tupac Shakur, um, taken from us in 1996. So that was just kind of my tribute. Um, kind of sad by that. But life goes on and everybody knows what to do when you enter the room. What is the emoji that signifies the mood that you are currently in? Lolo is in a good mood. Lolo is cool. Hey, Lois. Alaba is, he's hugging everyone, giving out hugs. He says, hello, guys. Hey, Alaba, what? you're in Nigeria, man. What time is it there for you right now? It's got to be late at night. Pozo is here. Hey, Pozo. Pozo is here again with us on Friday. We've got another LinkedIn user. I'm going to cheat so I can figure out who this LinkedIn user is. Uh, I don't know who it is this time. I cannot find them. And Heather is here. Hey, Heather is in a good mood. Joe is cheating. Joe is in the chat. <laughs> Joe is that's in a my, good mood. That's my big cheese face. <laughs> Heather said that she's on PTO, so she logged on for, for, from her computer so she would not miss it. Heather, is everything? Oh, you're on paid time off. So, Heather, are you sick or are you on vacation? Let us know. If you're sick, we can... I don't know, send you well wishes. I was about to say send you some chicken noodle soup, but we can't do that. Oh, that's a lot. He says it's 2003 there, which is what you guys, I'm not good at those kind of calculations. What, 803 at night? 803, yeah. Yeah, 803. Yeah. 803. Gotcha. Military time. That's kind of good for today's story. Yes. And Clarence, Clarence, we got to catch up. Clarence is in a good mood, too. So you guys, look, we've got two really good stories for you all today. And um, if you remember from our uh, intro video, I named them uh, student loan money gone. So we're going to talk about student loans. And the other one I called military mayhem. So, you know, I like to come up with these titles that give us some clues as to what we're talking about. But while we're here, I'm just going to tell you guys, here's, here's, here's the mood that I'm in today. I'm in a good mood, which goes back to one of Mark's earlier questions. Mark asked, am I eating three meals a day now? Mark, I am back on solid food. I'm getting there slowly but surely. Solid meals. Yes, sir. Although this morning I had a smoothie for breakfast. I think um, I think you should report back on all the snack foods you asked everybody in that LinkedIn post what their favorite go-to oh. quick foods were. I think you should report on that. I want a report out of what everyone said because I saw some good ones on there. You know what? You 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 know what? You're right. I should actually do that. Heather says she's okay. She's just take well, kind of okay. She's taking a mental health day. <laughs> we all need those. Yep. Kelly said mental health days are good for you. There you go. So look, Kelly, Joe, how are you guys doing? I have family in town, so um, I'm going to need a mental health day. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Joe has family in town too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, a nine-year-old with an ear infection. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. now did you check that doctor bill though? You know, we just talked about medical fraud. I know, and I actually didn't have to even pay a copay when I left there. Urgent care, which you know, usually they try to get something out of you at urgent care. So we shall see what that bill comes back as. So Mark says he's mental every day, and he says, Sorry, Kelly. Well, and you know, what's so funny. I called about my, you guys have heard of my son's travails with everything. I called today and um, I was like, so we're waiting on insurance, but I have this like line item for pharmacy for $512. Like, can I get like it itemized? He's like, oh yeah, no problem. Why wouldn't they itemize it? It's $512 for pharmacy. Um, Yeah. And what is, yeah. Have you gotten it and was it legitimate? 
Well, no. So he just like, you know, a month Wait, later. No, you I'm haven't like, gotten it or no, it wasn't legitimate. <laughs> probably both. <laughs> I mean, they gave him a bag of fluids and probably not even any aspirin. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what $512 for pharmacy is in a, you know, hospital. Right. I'm, always, I'm always amazed how much those aspirin and ibuprofen cost. But man, they're more expensive at hospitals than it is at Walgreens or anywhere else. Well, and then they won't let you BYOB or BYOM, yeah. bring your own meds. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. Mark says that was for Joe's antibiotic for a son's ear infection. Yeah. Kelly got charged for. Joe. <laughs> well, the ear drops are what were so expensive for me this time around. I went to the pharmacy and the pharmacist, I think, was very ethical, told me to call the urgent care back and get another option because she didn't want me paying for the one that he prescribed me. I, yeah, so yeah. I was like, thank you so much for being honest with me telling me that there's a similar one that can do exactly the same she goes i don't she goes i don't even keep this one in stock for that reason um so i called back while i was at the pharmacy to get a different eardrops so anyway. so are you gonna go to back to the pharmacy and give them one of your books i think I, you should i should probably next time i'm in there i will definitely say thank you for for being the everyday ethicist and being honest yeah with me and yeah so and of course the urgent care was quite annoyed when i called back but i stood my ground so <laughs> there are good people left in this world there are yep i firmly believe that so guys before we get started on our stories oops uh wait <laughs> there we go all right www.fridayfraudster.com you can get back episodes of us doing this show. Now, if you go to that web address, you will get the audio only version because it is a podcast. It is also available on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, anywhere but Apple for now. You know, you guys know how I feel about Apple. Apple's doing me wrong. They're a pain to set up. But also, if you go to YouTube, oh, that's Garnell. That's who that was that I still can't see. Ah, anyway, so if you go to YouTube, you can find us there, too. Many of the videos are backlogged. I think I'll have them all caught up by Monday so that everything will be in sync to what we're doing. So if you have an audit department or if you have a compliance department or a fraud department and you want them to see this show, the back episodes are available. They're also available on LinkedIn if you go to my profile. But, you know, you may just want to carry us in your pocket. So. Don't forget, find us on your favorite podcasting platform or just go to FridayFraudster.com. So now, student loan, money gone. What are we talking about here? An employee of the U.S. Department of Defense has been charged with applying for millions of dollars in federal aid on behalf of fake students and hiring ghost writers to complete their online assignments. Randolph Stanley, age 42, an employee of the Defense Contract Audit Agency, the DCAA, used dozens of individuals, none of whom intended on earning degrees, to collect federal aid between 2005 and 2021. This is what prosecutors in Maryland announced on this past Monday. A total of $6.7 million in aid was dispersed to at least eight schools, which deducted tuition and then sent $6.2 million to students, including Stanley, who pocketed all or some of this money. Now, Stanley had previously worked as a student aid counselor in at least one of the schools, and we've learned now two of the schools which he defrauded, allegedly defrauded. Some student identities were stolen, whereas others allowed their information to be used in order to get student aid. So, wow. So now before we jump into this, let me explain to some people how that works. We have some people not from the U.S. and then we have some people in the U.S. that don't know how it works. So college in the U.S. is extremely expensive. The government subsidizes a fair amount of that. 
And in order to get a subsidy for that, and it's actually not really a subsidy, it's a loan because you have to pay it back in most instances. But in order to qualify for that aid, you fill out what's called the Free Federal Student Aid App Application, known as the FAFSA. When you fill out the FAFSA, what they do is they look at the total cost for you to attend college and then the total amount that your family is going to contribute. And then those two items, whatever's le left, you get a loan and you get some other aid, some aid that you don't have to pay back. But you essentially get a loan for that amount. So that's money in your pocket. The money is distributed to the school. The school takes what it needs to cover its tuition and fees, and then they give you, the student, the rest of that money. So that's how it works over here in the U.S. What he did was he, well, he used his know-how of the system to get loans fraudulently. Kelly, Joe, what do you guys think? Kelly, you want to go first? You want me to go first? Uh, you can go first. I I mean I think it's um, I think pers I think it's another example of a bad system, which is probably a whole nother conversation. Um, but obviously, I think what got me is that this is what this gentleman has essentially been doing his whole life, from 2005 to 2017. He's only 42, and I'm thinking, you know, in in some ways, what a brilliant um like very intricate scheme that he did and if he was putting that towards good he could be doing great things in the world like that i think that um is what struck me the most like this guy's life this has been his job for for his life you know i mean these are his four bank accounts this is i mean the fact that they got 6.2 million or he got back 6.2 million out of the 6.7 they got I mean, he he really, I mean, probably a brilliant person and sad that it wasn't used for better purposes. So, yeah. Yeah. In a couple of the uh, stories that I read, it doesn't say how it was discovered. Maybe I missed that, but I'm thinking that there were some tips. Could have been a tip. Um, could have been the fact, uh, what got me is the identity theft piece, right? So somebody eventually finds out somehow that they have they've been attending did you see up to eight in universities at one time one person so i mean you know that i think if i had to guess this got more complicated and the more complicated things are the more unethical they are right i mean we know that from enron simple is ethical like that simple and ethical go together so the more complicated this got and the more greedy he obviously got you know, these these identities he stole, they're not just attending one university, they're attending eight. You know, he has to keep up with them and, and all, you know, it just, it got too complicated. And I, that's how, you know, but very, of course, I mean, it could have been a tip, could have been something, could have been one of these people whose actually identities were stolen. Oh yeah, absolutely. So now Mark brings up a good point. This guy is obviously insane if he decided to complete hundreds of those FAFSA documents. It takes you like eight years to fill out to fill out a FAFSA application. Obviously, I'm exaggerating some, but it takes an extremely long time because Kelly actually agreed with Mark. Yep, FAFSA nightmare. But, um, but think about he hired people in Africa to take these courses. He's hiring people to fill out these applications too. I mean, he basically has probably a number of virtual assistants around the world <laughs> doing this, this for him. So I bet there are so many players of this. Oh, yeah. Well, it gets better. So you guys, let, let's continue and give more information to the story. See, I, I like to have the discussion first and then give some more information. This just seems kind of fun. So look, so he, he was employed by the Department of uh, Contract Audit Agency since October of 2018. But prior to that, he worked for one of the universities from between 2005 to 2007. The second university he worked for uh, from June to October of 2008. So he learned the system and he learned how to manipulate the system. And then he went to work for another government agency. Now, according to the criminal complaint, um, according to the criminal complaint, he allegedly paid part of the student loan repayments back part of the student loan repayments to participating writers 
based in Africa, who he asked to complete the classes for the participating students. So the role of the participating writers was allegedly to complete courses for the students to give up the appearance of having sufficient academic performance. So in order to get these loans from the government, you have to have what's called satisfactory academic progress, SAP. So you have to have the grades in order to continue to get the money semester after semester. So these were online courses, but it goes a step further. In order to avoid detection, with the help of some co-conspirators, he allegedly attempted to hide the IP addresses of the participating writers to prevent the universities from identifying shared IP or internet protocol addresses. So for those of you who don't know what that is, Every device that's connected to the Internet has an IP address, whether it's your phone, a pacemaker or a computer. So he actually tried to conceal the IP address addresses of his co-conspirators down in Africa, because obviously you wouldn't have that many people logging in from Africa for a U.S. university. Uh, I mean, usually your international students, they come here to actually get their education here. Uh, and now, as a part of the scheme, allegedly he maintained four separate bank accounts to conduct financial transactions. Some of the participating students reportedly ordered the universities to deposit student loan repayments into his personal bank accounts. So University One, the in the complaint, the university that's shown as University One, their records show that between 2015 and 2018, they deposited $530,000 in money um, into four bank accounts owned by Stanley. Also, um, reportedly in his scheme, he submitted false documents on behalf of some of the participating students. So these students were willingly a part of the fraud to meet college admission requirements. For example, in one affidavit, it said that um, he he conspired with foreign nationals to create fraudulent diplomas, fraudulent transcripts, and other documents that qualified them to be eligible to participate in college at these schools. So with that, the list goes on and on. I mean, you, this is why I said like this guy was doing so much and that there was one other piece in the on one of the articles about how he um he messed with the plagiarism tool so things wouldn't get caught as plagiarism yes. after he hired these people i mean the, the ip it, i mean you just listed all of those things and I, the list is incredibly long with the things this guy did like it amazed me i i've never seen such a talented fraudster. I know Kelly, you've seen lots of talented fraudster, but like this one, there was just so much information. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. I would love to see his computer, like the computer forensics of his computer. Oh my God. Just, I bet a heyday. And now, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Here's what I will say. You guys know that I spent 15 years of my career as a chief auditor in higher education. I can tell you that Fraudulent transcripts, fraudulent diplomas to get transfer credits happens all the time. And I can tell you that internal controls at some organizations are definitely weak and that can get that can get through the quote unquote scrutiny quite easily. Now, other the other thing that strikes me as odd, though, is we always talk about data analytics. Surely you would not have that many students with funds being submitted to one person's bank account, even though it was four different bank accounts, they were all his personal bank accounts. So I'm assuming by that, and, and I, again, I could be making a you know what out of me by assuming, but they didn't say business accounts, they said personal. So I'm assuming that all four of those accounts had his name on them. Even if they didn't, these were multiple students. So you had multiple students that had funds that were being directed to the same accounts. Data analytics would have caught this easily. And I can tell you, this is not something that universities regularly scan for. Now, audit departments attempt to try to get them to scan for these. But between the fake transcripts happens all the time because of weak controls in the higher education environment. Not checking bank accounts using data analytics. Another thing that regularly happens that would have helped to identify some of this. 
Yeah, that was my question when you were reading that was, was his actual paycheck being direct deposited to one of these bank accounts? Because that's, you know, that's one of those standard audit procedures we all have done over the years. You check AP, you know, wire transactions to bank account numbers to employee bank account numbers. I use employee emergency contract or contact addresses, uh, phone numbers. That's one of those tips that people always go, oh, I didn't even think to get that database from my HR. Whatever info you could use, yes, you don't have emergency contact bank info, but you have employee bank info for direct deposit these days. Bump those up against anybody, AP vendors. I mean, obviously student tuition payments, where they're going. I mean, you've got to start doing that stuff. Hey, so let, let's go back to our audience for a little bit. Heather said you have to fill them out again each year. And I forgot about that. You do have to fill the fast file. So by the time you finish filling out your first one, it's time, it's time to fill out the second one. Now, Pozo brings up a really good point. Uh, the people who work in the financial aid offices of universities are not compensated well. Wondering how they rationalize working for him for so little money, being that they kept so much of the money. I don't think the financial aid office personnel were actually working with this guy. He actually got students who were legitimate students to work with him. And then he also stole some students' identities and, and fraudulently used them. But Pozo brings up another point. People overseas are making a lot of money completing coursework for U.S. students. Pozo knows because she actually teaches at a college. Uh, and again, I, I saw a lot of that when I worked in higher education. So this is a, a very, very interesting case here where here's the other thing I wanted to bring up. The government paid six point seven million dollars to the universities. The universities took their cut for tuition and fees and paid Stanley six point two million dollars. So think about this. Only five hundred thousand dollars or so went to the actual universities for tuition and fees. Now, this brings up another problem in education, though. Our federal government is paying for. So here, here are the things that make up this figure. You have tuition, you have fees, and then you have what they call reasonable living expenses for students. So six point two million dollars went to students for reasonable living expenses from the federal government. Yeah, that's why I said the system seems broken at the beginning. You know, I'm I teach in higher ed. I've never like Robert. I've never been on the the audit side of higher ed. Uh, I've done some consulting work, but I I didn't realize until this story how broken that system seems to me. Because this is why, um, you know, this is this is why lottery winners when they win the lottery they go bankrupt you know, within like a year or two, when people get that much money, they spend it on things that they want, the luxuries. And I just, I feel like we're giving away money that people are using for other things. And I, I just wonder, I don't, it just seems so excessive to me. Well, here's the other side of that coin. We actually aren't just giving these people money. These are student loans that they have to pay back. Some of it may be Pell Grants, but some of it is actually student loans that some of these people, especially the ones who were given the money fraudulently, uh, who, whose identities were stolen. Now they're going to have this mark on their credit that it's going to take forever to get off because you can't even get that off in bankruptcy. So they're going to have to file a lot of paperwork to get this taken off, even though it was identity theft. But so these aren't. I was wondering if, I mean, is that how he got caught, right? I mean, Kelly's talking about, was it a tip? I was thinking maybe these somebody with the identity, you know, I, I think because it says federal aid, I think a lot of times, you know, people do think it's going to be forgiven. Um, and I know there there's different things for student loans, but I mean, how did he even rationalize in his own brain that he wouldn't get caught when knowing this is a loan versus a, a gift? Like that. Yeah. I don't. That's confusing to me. Yeah. In the midst of his genius, that's the one part that's like, wait a minute, what? Exactly. Yes. And I love, I love what Pozo just wrote when he goes to jail. I was going to say when he goes to jail, he should have to spend a certain part of his day fixing with the credit bureaus, the people he stole their identity. That should be it's kind of like when, you know, you're a drunk driver and you hurt or God forbid, kill someone. You have to go around and, you know, educate call or high school students about it. Pozo. Perfect. Yeah. So Pozo says when he goes to jail, 
He'll be able to get community service and a reduced sentence for teaching workshops for high school students and college students to fill out the FAFSA. Yep. Yeah. That's it exactly. Um, you know, th this whole thing stinks in so many different ways. First, you have so much money that is not being spent on tuition and fees that's being given to students. Now, granted, some of it is being given as Pell Grants that they don't have to pay back. Some of it is being given as loans that they have to pay back. It's going to take these students 30 years to pay back student loans. That, that's what you get. You get a 30 year loan. Uh, even the ones who did it fraudulently, I'm not sure why they would actually sign up for this because you do have to pay the money back. That's not a part of a grant. So I'm assuming some of this must have been a Pell Grant. Now, on the school side, again, you have so many students that have money going to four different bank accounts. Again, one school, one, uh, one school had 65 instances where they were involved with this guy's fraud. So imagine 65 students having money going to the same four different bank accounts. Again, data analytics could have got this. But to you guys' point, how did he get caught? Now, one thing I, I would say is, Maybe when the student loans came due, but they don't become due until six months after you graduate or if you stop attending school. So he could have done this for years, but at some point he would have gotten caught. But there's just so much wrong here that shows how strong controls can prevent, well, this nonsense that we see here. Yeah. And, and Mark said uh, that government's doing this in so many types of programs. And I mean, it's not. It's not just the government. This makes me think of insurance companies. I mean, you get into a car accident and you get a check for five grand to get your car fixed based on an estimate that you could have your buddy at the car mechanic give you for way higher. And then what are they doing? They might get their car fixed for two thousand dollars and then they're pocketing the rest of the three, you know, the the remainder of the three thousand. Like this is these are kind of broken programs all around. I mean, I think um, there's lots of examples of this. Yeah. Well, and Dan brings up a good point. Ironic that colleges teach this, but they can't apply it to their own operations. Well, this also goes to um, the corporatization or the, you know, businessization. Is that a word? Um, of colleges. I mean, you know what? They've got, they, they have financial needs too. And the way that the world is going right now, people are questioning whether a four year degree is worth it. And they're under a lot of pressure. And I'm not saying that that would allow them any sort of rationale for this, but I'm just saying that, you know, schools are under financial pressures and um, willing to turn a blind eye to things. Well, it's like, it's like doctors, right? They want to get the insurance as much out of insurance companies as they want. I mean, colleges want to get as much out of financial aid as they can or, or those programs as well. But I mean, it still just astounds, astounds how much, how little goes to the university and how much goes to the student that, you know, probably hasn't even maybe necessarily been taught what to do with that, all that money, you know, and it, it, you know, is it going to room and board? Is it going to books? I, it just seemed so excessive, especially when all we read about is how high college tuition is here in yeah. the U.S. It's, it's amazing. Well, and, and I tell you what, um, the the news stories that I read and even in the indictment, it said that the colleges are not to blame for this, meaning that they didn't actively participate in the fraud. Now, I will say, I do disagree with that to a certain extent because the lack of controls allowed this to happen. Again, this is one that was very easily detectable based on some basic controls. And, and again, having work in, worked in that industry for over 15 years, I have directly seen fraudulent transcripts and I've seen things like that as well. Um, the transcripts are easy. They, they aren't as easy to detect as the data analytics, but there are certain things that you can do with those. So typically what ends up happening is you have someone that will send in a transcript in their native language. And if you're not careful in your office that reviews the transcripts, you'll just see A, B, C, and well, this foreign language here. What you should do is run it through an agency that does a correct translation for you. Then you should also do a little bit of due diligence. There are also services that will 
check your transcripts for you and give you a, a sign off. This is a legitimate school. These are legitimate grades. These are legitimate classes. I'm willing to bet that these universities either A, did not use those or B, had someone in the office that was a little lax on those particular days, maybe 65 times at that one university. So this was weak controls in the university system environment as well, hands down. And I know they weren't, they were working really hard not to identify the university, but I think one of the articles narrows it down to a yep. global online campus. And, you know, that is where internal auditors that are especially working in that environment, this is not brick and mortar higher ed anymore. This is global online and the fraud schemes are only going to show that more and more. So you've got to start thinking outside the box on what your audit procedures look like, because this yeah. is a different environment, right? Audit is to the business. And again, it's, let me just say this. I've investigated a few frauds directly related to this before. It's not that difficult to find. Not that difficult to find at all. So now we have reached our halfway point. So Joe, Kelly, what are you guys up to? Uh, you want me to go? Oh. Yeah, let's start with Joe. Um, I'm only going to do this one more time because this book club is next Thursday. So I've actually had so many of you guys on Friday Fraudster join that I'm um, super excited that me plugging it has actually helped get more and more of you on it. Uh, we'll be talking about Think Again by Adam Grant next Thursday, June 24th. And I hope you guys all join cpebookclub.com. It's going to be an audit auditing field of study. CPE. We're going to talk about how we can think again as auditors. So join next Thursday. Awesome. Kelly. So my, oh, my plug is for the ACFE Global on Monday. Um, I am doing your brand as a CFE and I'm really excited to do it because I think it's so incredibly important. And Friday Fraudster is one of like, you know, it's part of our brand these days. So first time I've ever done it. Awesome slides. Of course, there's pink. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. So I don't know if you want to say in the chat if you're going to ACFE Global. But um, I would love to see you there. And any tips on what you think about brand would be awesome. Oh, now, you know, I can talk all day about personal branding. So anyway, well, what am I doing? Y you guys, starting the 1st of July, we are doing another cohort of the Ask Better Questions boot camp. Uh, if you would like to join a life altering, life changing boot camp, just shoot me a message on LinkedIn and we can talk about it and we can get you signed up. Some other things that I'm working on, I'm working on a few white papers right now with a few organizations about auditing. That's pretty cool. Um, obviously, the Friday Frosters, I'm working hard to get us on all the podcasting platforms and to get us caught up. I have another show that I'm doing with Andy Kovacs. Andy Kovacs is over in the UK. We call it the Big Question Show. We talk about how to ask good questions questions. And I think you guys should tune in. We do that on Thursdays, I believe. And stay tuned for a really short show coming from just me. Ooh, I'm going all alone. We're calling the show Audit Bites, and we're going to spend 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, talking about a different topic directly related to internal auditing. That's either going to be starting next week or the week after. I hadn't really decided yet. So stay tuned, guys. Stay tuned. I appreciate all of your support so now so can i make a quick suggestion or yeah. idea what are you guys in the audience doing that you want to promote put it in the chat is Ooh. there anything you attendees want to promote because we want to help you too you know that's a good idea i love it and we will give a few lois you're leaving lolo lolo says have a great weekend bye lois Thanks for stopping by. So, yeah, while you guys enter some of that into the chat, we will get ready for our next story that we've called Military Mayhem. <sighs> Lokish says, good luck on your session, Kelly. Lokish, I didn't know you were here. You've been really low key today, Lokish. <laughs> Uh, oh, by the way, Lokish, 
since I have you here. Tomorrow does work for me. Let's book it. The Zoom session. <laughs> Got to handle some business while I'm here. I'm so busy. Sometimes I get uh, I get uh, sidetracked. So military mayhem. So look, guys, here's the story. And if you can see, this story is directly from a magazine called Military Times. Two former managers for a major privatized housing company have pleaded guilty to fraud charges in connection with conspiracy to cover up poor maintenance at military families' homes. All right, look, I've got a video that I'm going to show from a news story so that you guys can really understand what's been happening here, because this thing is a true hot mess. So let's just check out this news story from CBS News. While U.S. service members risk their lives fighting for our country, many of their families live in dirty and dangerous homes. Our investigation found one of the military's largest housing contractors apparently misled the Air Force to qualify for millions of dollars in bonus payments. The FBI is now investigating. Omar Villafranca has been reporting on this story. Omar, what have you found? Well, good morning. Balfour Beatty Communities manages 40,000 homes on 55 military bases across the country. And its performance bonuses are estimated to get this be potentially worth about $800 million over decades long contracts. Now, did you guys hear that? $800 million over a decades long contract. All right, Kelly, Joe, obviously there is more to the story, but what do you guys think so far? Okay, Joe, you go first because I know you were just chomping about performance. I, I just, I, this story, like Robert, it makes me so mad. I can't believe, uh, I, I just, I can't believe it went on. Number one, went on for so long, I guess, too. It, and for the sacrifice of people, like human stakeholders, for, I don't, just corporate, right? Robert, what was it that you said when we were, the three of us were chatting about this? Do you remember in, in our LinkedIn message? There, oh, oh, other than the fact that it made me mad. Well, <laughs> I know. Oh, hold on. I'll find it. I just thought it was perfect for how I felt about this. Hold on. Um, they're too big to fail. Oh, Government, yeah. sorry. Side total sidetrack. But, you know, I think what makes me mad is this was obviously a contract with a company that completely defrauded its stakeholders, wasn't doing what it was supposed to do it, be doing. Robert and I, were, we were having a conversation on, do they still have the contract? Well, yes, they probably do because they're too big to fail. And I hate that. I hate this corporate mentality uh, that's come out in this one that, you know, hurt humans. All right. Now, this one is an extremely interesting one. And I know I seem to say that every week, but the story gets better. And rather than me compiling and summarizing news stories. I just want you guys to hear directly from someone involved in this. So what we're going to do is go back to the news story. And this thing gets unbelievable, you guys. You just have to hear this. Employees at Tinker kept two sets of books. Calls were first recorded on paper and entered into a computer system monitored by the Air Force only when a job was nearly completed. This made it appear that the company was responding quickly to residents' problems and kept it eligible for millions in performance-based bonuses. Whenever you generate a work order, it automatically puts today's date on it, and it's like a stopwatch. So if you entered them into the computer, they were automatically on the clock. Exactly. In 2014, Tina Brown was hired by Balfour Beatty to schedule repairs at Tinker. Did they give you any express directions to not enter things into a computer? Yes, definitely. The management was all concerned about appearances and collecting their bonuses and appearing right for corporate. In a statement, Balfour Beatty said it has not and does not condone the falsification of records in any way. According to the company, allegations of misconduct at Tinker date back several years. And after being investigated by the Air Force, one employee was found to have acted improperly. Do you feel like you were the scapegoat? Yes, definitely. I know I was. Brown, an hourly employee who received no performance bonus, was fired in 2016. No one else was reprimanded, and she's now suing for wrongful termination. 
Balfour Beatty's Tinker Base Manager at the time told Reuters the request to doctor maintenance records came from his superiors, and company training documents instructed employees to modify and correct work orders to comply with mandated response times. Did you ever feel like you were doing something wrong? I did, yes. How did you square that away? I just did what I was told. All right, guys. So now let's take a step back for a minute and let's put a few things into context with this as well. So I can tell you, my father retired from the Air Force 20 years in the military. And so historically, what happened was you had housing that was on the military base and all of the maintenance and stuff like that was handled by the federal government. Now, at some point in time, the government said, let's outsource these things because private organizations can do it better than us. So what happens is this company is, is large. Is What did we say? Fifty five thousand housing units across. Just that's just the U.S., I think. <laughs> Uh, several different military bases. So now what you have is some housing still on military base, some adjacent to military bases, and some actually in cities that these people were supposed to make sure were adequately maintained. And what they were doing was they got performance bonuses from the government when they were actually able to enter work orders into their system and have the work orders completed within a certain amount of time. The government gave them bonuses because that showed that well, the complaints that your resident, your tenants had, you were completing them timely. So now these people were ordering other, were, the people at the top were ordering people that worked for them to keep two sets of books. So in one set, they would say, okay, we got this work order in. And when the work was almost complete, that's when they would have them enter the information into the system to make it look like it was a fast turnaround time. In other instances, they were entering things into the system and actually marking them as complete, even when they were not complete, leaving these families in homes that had mold, mildew, uh, rodents, ants, all kinds of things that no one should be required to live in. While our men and women were all fighting for our country, the people that they were that they that were left here were living in horrible conditions. That is sorry. I'm done with that now, Joe Kelly. You know, this reminds me of, um, I just finished Michael Lewis's new book, The Premonition, and there's a guy in there, Carter Mesher, and he worked for the VA. And I don't know if you guys remember the VA, they were having the issues about um, waiting times were too long. And he went in and he like fixed it instantly because he's like this, you know, savant. But this is again, the same sort of like issue. Well, and it, it reminds me just going, go back to TQM principles, total quality management. I teach Deming's philosophies. And the first thing he did was throw out incentive systems, based systems. And why? Because they incentivize bad behavior. And this, I think the fact that this is a performance-based system makes me crazy because you're, you're incentivizing them to falsify to get their money. Like, you know, let's just come up with a fair compensation for the work being performed. Um, and, and I think that's the, the problem a lot of companies get into. Wells Fargo, I, you know, I have to always bring that one up. The eight is great motto. That's why they were opening eight fraudulent accounts for every customer or seven. If they only had one, they incentivized bad behavior. And this is the exact same thing. The government incentivized this poor behavior, I think. Let's just pay these privatized companies fairly and for the work that they're doing. So they're not in incentivized to fake. Did you guys, did you guys see the other part of it? This is a 10 year contract. Now here, here's something else. Just, just to add a little bit more to this in one email to a number of subordinates on March uh, 4th, 2016, this was cited in one of the court documents a high up person in the company said, please provide real answers to the legitimate open work orders and then close the ones that need to be closed today. I don't care what it takes. Then moving forward, do not let it get this way again. It's not only my ass on the line because of these work orders, but my bosses and her bosses understand where this is going. So 
they have evidence in emails that they were saying to cover this up. Now, I want you to understand this clip that we just watched is equally as despicable because what they did was they did an internal investigation and they ended up terminating the lady that we saw on television here. Now, here's where I would say any internal auditors watching, listening, if you're at this company, think about this woman was terminated for this behavior, but she had no incentive to participate in this behavior. She was not on the bonus structure. So what happened here? You had the scapegoat that they hung out to dry. This is the person that we're going to put up as the face of doing this. Why would she do it? She had no elements of the fraud triangle to do it. She didn't have the rationalization. She didn't, she didn't have any reason to do it. She was not compensated for this, but yet she was the one that was terminated and we found this to be okay. She, she was rationalizing. I mean, one of the blind spots yeah. that I always talk about is the boss blind spot, the leader blind spot. And, and she said it exactly in her quote. She was just doing what she was told. Sadly, Fair enough. that's what people do. They rationalize that they're just following orders. It's not their ethics. It's their boss's ethics. They're just going to do it. I, I mean, this is why I constantly ask people. Would you quit your job before your own ethics? And obviously this lady wasn't ready to quit her job to hold uphold her own ethics. And that's what, I mean, I, I feel very badly for her that she was the scapegoat, but she should have not participated. We all have a choice in, in what true. we participate in. But well, I guarantee she rationalized she wanted to keep her job. So she apparently, when they escorted her out, she like screamed, you know, about this. But this also goes to the ACFE report to the nations. The lower level employees are punished so much than more than the higher level employees. And again, it goes to my whole, and excuse my friend chair, um, FU fund. You have to be able, and I was, I taught Dan, uh, a section of Dan Ramey's course the other night, and we had a whole thing about the FU fund. You have to be able to walk away from it. And it's easy for us to say that when you're not in the thick of it, yeah. but, um, you know, maybe she needed health insurance, but who knows what it is, but the lower level people need to really understand they are the ones that get thrown under the bus. Oh yeah. Now. Right? Oh. If you missed Kelly's uh, episode on my podcast, The Corporate Quitters, Kelly talks about the FU fund. Uh, yeah, shameless plug again. Now, let, let's let's go back to our audience for one minute, though. Mark says 90 percent of people wouldn't do it. They wouldn't quit. You're absolutely right. Mark has been on a roll. Mark also says we have been hoodwinked uh, on the concept of privatization. Uh, private companies that choose to oh private companies that choose to can rip us off better than we can rip ourselves off yes and now mark brings up another point they low bid it on the contract because they knew their profit margin was well funded in the bonuses and if you think about it government contracts really are almost 90 percent of the time 99.9 .9 percent of the time awarded to the lowest bidder and was that you kelly i was talking to that had the neil armstrong quote about uh being an astronaut and it wasn't you Maybe it was Joe. It wasn't either one of you. I thought I was talking to one of you guys one day. And, and here, here was the quote. Neil Armstrong, the astronaut, said he was very proud to know that the, the, the vehicle that was carrying him to space was built by the lowest bidder for the contract. And of course, that was sarcastic. Right. But government contracts are usually given to the lowest bidder. And Alaba says nice one from Joe. That was a nice one because, I mean, I stand correct that she did rationalize. Uh, so. You are very correct about that. So, oh, one other thing that I forgot when we ask people, what are you, what, what is your cause for the month or just at any point in time? Lolo, Lois Carter, June is National Hunger Awareness Month and the Hemp Sisters Nation wants to reignite this conversation with the hopes to save even one of the 25,000 people that die each day from hunger and disease. So what they're doing is they are donating money to this worthy cause. So any money that they get is going to this worthy cause. Thank you, Lolo. I love that. Okay. So since we said that, can, this is totally crazy off the knot. Um, uh, Mackenzie, uh, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, what she just gave away. And you know what is so incredibly funny? So he just bid for um, you get a fly into space with him. And he gave... It was the highest bidder one. It was $28 million. And Mackenzie gave away 
billion or $2.7 billion. And that's her third round of funding. And it's just, is so incredible. So yeah, I, yeah, I saw that too. I know it was just too funny, but also listening to the podcast this morning about that it's pivot. It's Friday. It's my morning ritual is, and this Mark, you're going to appreciate this. I think and not to be political, but since Reagan, it's like government employees aren't the best. And we need to the we need to stop that conversation. Like it's just we need to stop it. And actually, a woman just got appointed to the chairwoman of the FTC. She is 32 years old. And I hope that our world is changing where people don't look as at government employees as hacks. They're not hacks. Like I was a government employee, not a hack. So yeah, okay. Sorry, soapbox. <laughs> well, this this one to me is it's not is I mean it is the government that to me was pushing this or allowing this to some degree. The company I don't know if Robert you maybe I'm jumping ahead you're going to get here. One of the other companies of the Balfour, the property manager said it's like they're operating a bank robbery at a corporate level. And then he said, I got to the point where I was waking up in the morning and wondering, well, how many people am I going to have to screw over today? And so this, you know, maybe that corporate mentality is bleeding into government, you know, as well. But like this to me is like this company that was contracted by the government to perform a service, had a ton of employees that didn't have strong enough ethics to speak up and speak out against what was happening. that That's what really blew me away is how many people had that mentality there. Cause that's exactly right. like the last one. So let's just call a spade a spade here. And let's just look at all of the failures that occurred and all of the terrible people who allowed these failures to occur. They have emails from internal employees at this company that allowed this to happen. Some of those employees as we can see with this one woman, weren't even under an incentive plan. They just wanted to keep their job. These are still terrible people because they did not shed light on what was happening. But let's take a look at the other side of this too. This company definitely had to have some internal audit staff. This is, you have a huge government contract, $800 million over 10 years. Now, if that isn't risky to your company, because this is an $8 billion company, I believe. So if that didn't boil up on your risk assessment to look at these maintenance contracts, something is wrong there. But now let's take a look at the federal government. You can't tell me that they don't have an internal whistleblower program to where some of these people in some of these homes actually called the government and said, these homes that I'm staying in are terrible. We need to do something about that. By the way, while I'm on this point, let me just go ahead and get to the news story that shows that this must have had to happen because if they're telling the news outlets, surely they told the government and nothing was done until it hit the news. So that is pathetic on all fronts. Documentation process at Tinker. But several families say maintenance and record keeping problems continue. Door frames starting to fall apart. Derek, a naval flight engineer who asked us not to use his last name, lives on base but has deployed more than half the year, leaving his wife Jennifer and three kids to deal with frequent housing issues. The fact that they're actually making a profit and being able to get their bonuses is just ludicrous. People need to be held accountable for these conditions. Mm -hmm. They need to be held accountable. Derek pays for. So now, you know, you I have a great punishment, a great punishment along the eye for an eye. Put the executives and make them and their families live in these places. Like yeah. it'll never happen. But wouldn't that be joyous? We could like put a camera in there. We could make like, you know, must see TV with executives from Balfour having to live in those places. Like, let's be creative here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and here's the thing. You mean to tell me that at no point in time did this young man who we just saw pictured speak to his commanding officer and say, the housing that I'm in is terrible. Of course they did. So the government can say, we subcontracted this out. Oh, it's their fault. No, 
your your military officers at some point in time came to your internal whistleblower program and complained and nothing was done. So there's some dual accountability there. Well, well, it's also like the distance. So like, you know, clothing manufacturers don't own the factories in China anymore. And so they can say, well, you know what? Hands off. We don't own it. It's it's kind of the same sort of thing. Yeah. It is, And there was a different contract. Right. So it was the people they were complaining to the higher ups in the Air Force also were contracting with the Air Force like I'm going to say financial aid, but that's not it, like special aid. So there were two Air Force associations involved that were in conflict as well. So in my mind, this is kind of a conflict of interest story, too, once you get into it. And I'm going to drop the links to the article in the comments as well for everyone. Now, I'll show you guys something else that's pretty interesting, too. This isn't the first time that this organization has gotten in trouble. So, oh boy, I've got the wrong thing up right now. Here we go. So they agreed to pay 2.25 billion uh, pounds, sorry, million pounds over allegations of bribery in Egypt. But check out the date on this article. That was October the 6th, 2008. So this activity is not new with this organization. Um. And that's why I sent the joke to you, Joe, saying that they were too big to fail because they are a worldwide organization that specializes in property maintenance. Uh, how big is the problem? Who knows? But we know that it was at least prevalent in about six United States Air Force bases. We also know that there was a problem also in Egypt. This is a UK based organization. Right. So that's our story for today, guys. Those are our two stories for today. Um, I would say that they are both very doggone interesting. Um, I think that there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from student loan, money gone. Um, there's a lot that we can do with data analytics in our organizations to try and catch fraud. Again, it's easy for us to play Monday morning quarterback. But again, in some of these environments, it's a no brainer to put in the minimum level of controls. Uh, military mayhem. This was an example of wrong incentives. And I love it that Joe always talks about wrong incentives. I mean, it, you're incentivizing them on how quickly they can fix these things, but yet they control everything. What happened to that third party? provider management? What happened to auditing your third party providers? What happened to listening to your ultimate customers, our military men and women who you know good and well they complained at some point in time? What happened there? Anything you guys want to say? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, this is just. No, you're right. Lots of lessons from both of our stories today. Yeah. Good. Um, If you guys have any stories, send them to us. We said that the first couple episodes, but uh, Kelly and Robert and I, maybe we should drop our emails in the comments so that we can make sure we're still talking about the stories that you guys are seeing too. Oh yeah, that is a very good point. So yeah, uh, you can reach me at rob at that audit guy .com. Um, I'll put them in the comments. Or always on LinkedIn. Thanks, Joe. So Joe has put in our emails. That'll be on the replay. If you see any stories, especially if there's some stories that you you have some firsthand knowledge of, we can bring you on as a special guest. Um, and, and realize, too, our objective here is not to ridicule. Our objective here is to make business environments better. Um, you, you saw a ring of people here that worked for an organization that were complicit. Why were they complicit? They were afraid that they were going to lose their jobs. Now, I say that's cowardice. As Kelly says, you got to have your FU fund up. And at some points in time, you've got to say goodbye. If you can't change it from the inside, you've got to say, I'm gone because this is too corrupt for me. 
Yvonne says she will send a Jamaican one. I appreciate that, Yvonne. Alava is saying special guest. Yeah, man, we'd love to have you on. Send us one from Nigeria. Seriously. I mean, fraud is everywhere, so there's bound to be some fraud in Nigeria. Joe, Kelly, any anything you guys want to say as last words today? Have a great weekend, as usual. See you guys next, week. next Friday. Yeah.